Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 651 for July 23rd, 2017. Coming up in a few minutes. I arrived by, by airplane and got off in the dark, snowy west. It was only about minus 30, and they told me to get a rental car and drive to Gimli. And uh, pretty dark, pretty cold and blowy. I thought, what the hell am I doing? One of the fun things about Whiskey Cast is being able to talk to retired distillery workers about their careers. Jim Boyko worked his way up from being an apprentice at the old Seagram's Distillery in Waterloo, Ontario, to overseeing distillery projects for Diageo. But when he retired, he and his family stayed in Gimli, Manitoba, where he spent years working at Diageo's Crown Royal Distillery and still leads the occasional tour for guests. We'll talk with Jim later on Whiskey Cast in depth. I'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, and the What I'm Tasting This Week department all coming up on this week's Whiskey Cast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique, but a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. There's been talk of reviving whiskey production at the old Dallas Dew Distillery in Scotland for at least the last four years now. The former Speyside Distillery is now a distilling museum managed by Historic Environment Scotland and draws around 10,000 visitors each year. The Press and Journal reports that the government agency is expected to make a decision before the end of the year on whether to move ahead with distilling. Scottish parliamentarian Richard Lockhead has been pressing for the revival of distilling at Dallas Dew for some time now. He wants to see it become what he calls a national center for whiskey excellence. Dallas Dew is still technically owned by Diageo, and the company told us this time last year that it would not stand in the way of resuming whiskey production at Dallas Dew if that's what Historic Environment Scotland wants to do. We'll keep you posted as more details are available. Meanwhile, the owners of Dublin's Liberties Distillery have picked up a new partner. Quintessential Brands has sold a 25% stake in its Irish whiskey business to London-based Stock Spirits for around $21 million. The investment will be used to finance completion of the distillery, which is on track to open next spring. The deal also includes a stake in the Dubliner and the Dublin Liberties Irish Whiskey brands, along with Quintessential's range of Irish cream liqueurs. Stock Spirits operates primarily in Eastern Europe and distributes whiskies from Diageo, Beam Suntory, and Distel, along with other spirits. It's also behind the Hammerhead Czech single malt whiskey, which was released in 2010 after the company's owners bought the Prodlo Distillery and found casks of whiskey distilled back in 1989 when the distillery was still owned by Czechoslovakia's communist government. Also on the business front, the Bardstown Bourbon Company is adding a Wall Street heavyweight to its board of directors. Former Morgan Stanley chairman and CEO John Mack has joined the company's board. He retired from the investment firm in 2011 and is also the former co-CEO of Credit Suisse. The distillery has completed the first phase of its expansion that doubled production capacity to 3 million proof gallons of spirit a year and is on track to open its visitors' center by the end of this year. Heaven Hill is wrapping up the latest expansion at its Bernheim distillery in Louisville, The two-year-long project is expected to bring Bernheim's annual production to around 40 million gallons of new-make spirit, or about 600,000 barrels. The distillery is in the middle of a three-week-long summer shutdown, 
and master distiller Denny Potter says the final work is being wrapped up. Most of the mechanical stuff is in place. We have changed over our entire control system. So that's what we're buttoning up right now, and we'll probably be mashing any day. So it's a little bit chaotic right now down at Bernheim, but uh, but it's good. I mean, we're having a lot of fun with it, and we put a lot of time into that over the last two years. So we're we're ready to get that done and move on to the next thing. <laughs> so what is the next thing? That's You know, it's uh, uh, at some point probably another expansion. You know, it's uh, we'll continue to build warehouses. I mean, that's, you know, we've got 54 in operation now. We'll have... Uh, uh, 55 opened up uh, later this year, probably October, November is what we're um, benchmarking, and then and then we'll we'll probably build another one or two next year, and another one or two for two or three years after that. And and with that, we have you know we're looking at our distillery capacity and the things we can be doing there. And even with this expansion coming online, the plan is to continue to run 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Uh, and literally, you know, we'll be getting our our annual demand plans in. Uh, here in a little bit, we'll take a look and see what that looks like, and then how that impacts you know today's distillery production or next year's distillery production. So, I mean, there's a daggone good chance that when we wrap this expansion up, we are already working on our next expansion. Denny's also been busy on the whiskey front. Heaven Hill announced the final details this week on the upcoming Parker's Heritage Collection release. As we first reported last month, it'll be an 11-year-old single-barrel bourbon, but as with all of the Parker's Heritage Collection releases, there's more to it than that, especially this year. It's a special selection for us because it's the first selection since Parker passed earlier this year. It's going to be an 11-year-old, so 11-year-old single barrel uh, at 122 proof, and it'll be non-chill filtered. If I remember correctly, this comes from some of his uh, favorite warehouses out in Dietzville. Correct. You know, right now we have six different warehouse locations and, you know, Deetsville is one of those locations and it was, um, it was certainly Parker's favorite location. I mean, he, he, he picked a lot of good barrels out of that. So we thought uh, that would be the best thing for us to do is to do the same thing, you know, try to, to pick some really good barrels out of the Deetsville warehouse site, which is not a hard thing to do, but uh, that was certainly in honor of him as well. And let's talk about, uh, the cause again. Obviously, we know Parker died from complications of ALS, and uh, Heaven Hill's been really active about uh, the way it uh, has tried to raise money for ALS since Parker was diagnosed years ago. Obviously, yeah. I mean, so, you know, we started this 10, 11 years ago, um, but Parker's diagnosis came later. And it's really, you know, the Parker's collection has kind of taken on a new meaning in the fact that, you know, we, we dedicate, I believe it's uh, $10 a bottle to the ALS Foundation, it's taken on a whole nother cause outside of uh, you know, the Parker's release being a special release that you know we only do one time a year, and it was something that Parker was very passionate about. Now it, you know, there's a passion that that is carried through to the ALS Foundation, and we've we've generated quite a bit of money over the years for that, and uh, you know it's something that we'll continue to do year in and year out. The 2017 Parker's Heritage Collection release will carry our recommended retail price of $129 a bottle. Other new whiskeys to mention this week. Glen Cadam is releasing a new 13-year-old single malt named The Reawakening. It's made with some of the first whiskey distilled back in 2003 when Angus Dundee Distillers reopened Glen Cadam after it had been closed for three years. It's bottled at 46% ABV, 3,000 bottles will be available, with a recommended retail price of $65 each. That's The Reawakening, and there's a second edition of The Murray from Tullabardine. It was distilled in 2004 and matured in First Fill X bourbon barrels, then finished in Chateauneuf de Pape red wine casks from France's Rhone region. The whiskey gets its name from Sir William Murray, the second Marquess of Tullabardine, the debut release of the Murray won several major awards over the last few months. The Murray Chateauneuf de Pape single malt will be available in Germany exclusively starting this month, with a wider release expected in early 2018. There's also a second edition of Tomatin's Warehouse 6 collection out now. The 1972 Warehouse 6 bottling follows last year's release of the 1971 edition, it comes from three ex-Sherry hogsheads filled one after another back in 1972. 
We know that from the consecutive cask numbers. Only 380 bottles will be available, with a recommended price of £2,000, around $2,600 each. I try to avoid politics in the news when I can, but here's a story I just can't resist. P.T. Wood of Woods High Mountain Distillery in Salida, Colorado, has been active in whiskey politics for a while. He's the president of the Colorado Distillers Guild, and he's also active in local politics, too. He's been on the town's planning and zoning commission for the last 10 years. Now, P.T. is turning his sights to higher office. Denver's Westward reports that Wood is running for mayor of Salida in November's election. There is a bit of a precedent here. Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper went from owning a brewery in Denver to becoming mayor and then governor. Good luck, P.T. And finally, if you're a woman who's into bourbon, or no one who is, the bourbon women are getting ready for their fourth annual symposium next month. It's a weekend conference at the historic Brown Hotel in downtown Louisville. Longtime bourbon writer Susan Riegler is the president of the Bourbon Women. It's just always a fabulous time. We have women coming in from all over the country who um, just enjoy bourbon, but really enjoy getting to know each other, uh, making lots of connections. We've had several mother-daughter pairs who come to the symposium, which is really a lot of fun. Um, So it's just a, a weekend of people enjoying learning about bourbon, talking about bourbon, tasting some bourbon, and we always have uh, excursions. We go to distilleries, uh, which is especially popular, of course, with the people from out of state who've perhaps never had the opportunity to do that, as well as doing some kind of behind-the-scenes tours that are also not necessarily very accessible to um, the local bourbon lovers, things like uh, Brown Foreman Cooperage, for instance. We will be having a, a dinner at the Fraser History Museum on Friday night, which has an excellent prohibition uh, exhibit. So we'll be having a, a reception there and enjoying uh, our winning Not Your Pink Drink cocktail uh, for our annual contest. Uh, so we'll be doing that on, on Friday night and um, Saturday. Uh, Bill Samuels, Jr. is going to be our keynote speaker, which we're very excited about. You know, Of course, Bill. Mother Marge was the one who was so instrumental in giving Maker's Mark its signature look with the red wax, and um, he's just going to talk about the importance of uh, women in the bourbon industry and probably his mom in particular, I would think. Tell me about this uh, Not Your Pink Drink cocktail. This sounds interesting. Ah, Right. Well, we we have a contest every year which opened up to both amateur and professional mixologists, and we ask people to make a bourbon cocktail and... The only stipulation in the rules that we're really hard and fast about is it can't be pink. Okay, this is sort of your anti-Cosmo cocktail revolution here. So that's that's the deal. So we we've had uh, some really some wonderful award-winning drinks in the past. Um, One that comes to my mind is something called the the French Quarter Manhattan uh, that one of our members. This was in the amateur category. Uh, used uh, a pecan liqueur along with uh, bourbon and some bitters and just came up with a really tasty riff on the Manhattan, which was fun. So um, we we encourage people to get out their bourbon creativity and enter the contest. The symposium is August 25th through the 27th in Louisville. There's a link in the show notes for this week's episode at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul, and a brand new website. Check it out today at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreast Lestow edition a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Listeo. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeo edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Redbreast Lustau is now the latest award-winning member of the Redbreast family. It is Whiskey Advocates 2016 Irish Whiskey of the Year. 
Try a bottle for yourself. We're still looking for your support in the 2017 Podcast Awards. Whiskey Cast is up for Best Arts Podcast and the People's Choice Award. But we need to be among the top 10 podcasts receiving nominations in each category to go on to the final round of judging next month. The deadline is July 31st, just a week away. If you'll please take just a moment and visit podcastawards.com, follow the instructions to nominate Whiskey Cast in both the Best Arts Podcast and the People's Choice Award categories, we'd really appreciate it. Again, that's podcastawards.com. And there's a link at whiskeycast.com, too. This week's Your Voice is sponsored by Lot 40. Here's another one of the questions from Quora.com, where I spend some time each week answering whiskey questions, some serious and some not so. Hunter Stacks asked me to answer this one that falls into that not-so-serious category. How would a debate between beer, wine, and liquor go? Of course, this is the very definition of a hypothetical question with no correct answer. So, here's how I answered it. Beer would get up and head for the restroom after 20 minutes. Wine would sit around and do nothing but wine and order cheese. Liquor would win the debate. Ask a silly question, get a silly answer. Let's get serious now. Last time around, I mentioned Evan Chapman's question about Lytle's house brand whiskeys. He's on his way to Glasgow and was wondering whether it was worth checking them out. I asked for some help on this from our listeners in the UK and Europe who shop at Lidl, and we had a bunch of responses. Derek Mather of the Artisan Restaurant in Wishaw, Scotland, knows his whiskeys well. He mentioned on our Facebook page that he has the 22-year-old Glen Alba from Lidl open in his restaurant, described it as quite a pleasant dram, not overly sherried, It's a good introduction to someone starting out on sherried whiskey. Michael McKenna in the UK added this, The 34-year-old is really something else. Such a good whiskey for the price. For what it's worth, Mark, you can't go wrong. But Dennis Edinger in London is apparently not a fan. He posted, Mine probably soon go down the sink as they are not good and I need space. They are not even good enough to blend away as they ruin it all. I have the Isla and all the blends. Better to invest the money in other bottles. Don't understand why all people like them, but marketing did work perfectly well here with a number and a cheap price. Definitely well done, Lytle, for that. Now, I know Evan was following the conversation on our Facebook page, and we'll have to see whether he picked anything up at Lytle when he gets home. This weekend, The Scotsman has an interesting feature by Sean Murphy, On his Scotch Whiskey Bucket List, 10 Things Every Whiskey Fan Should Do At Least Once. Several of the things on his list involve distillery visits, of course, along with master classes, trying out your favorite distillery's new make spirit, and even buying your own cask. Now that last one might be out of reach for most people, but the whole idea got me thinking. What's on your whiskey bucket list? Tell us on Facebook or Twitter, and I'll share some of the answers next time around. Of course, we're on Facebook and Twitter at WhiskeyCast, along with Instagram and Tumblr, too. If you're not into social media, my email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. If you're on Skype, you can leave a voicemail for us. Just look for WhiskeyCast in the Skype directory. And if you don't have Skype, you can record a voice memo on your phone and email it to us. That address again is comments at whiskeycast.com. This week's Your Voice is sponsored by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, it's unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. The last Friday night live of the summer at Woodford Reserve Distillery is coming up this Friday, July 28th in Versailles, Kentucky. Hard to Find Whiskey in Birmingham, England, is hosting a tasting of Tomatin and Kubakan whiskeys that same night. Whiskey Freedom 2017 is this coming Saturday in Perth, Australia, and Whiskey Live Adelaide is August 4th and 5th in Adelaide, Australia. Balconis Distilling is teaming up with the Milo Biscuit Company in Waco, Texas, 
for a tiki night and pig roast at the distillery on August 5th. Whiskey Fringe 2017 is in Edinburgh, Scotland from August 11th through the 13th. The Dublin Whiskey Festival is August 14th through the 20th in Dublin, Ireland. And M.B. Rowland Distillery in Pembroke, Kentucky has its Great American Eclipse Weekend from August 18th through the 21st at the spot where next month's total solar eclipse will be at its peak. Right now we have 139 different events around the world on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a festival or a tasting coming up, just use the contact form on our website and let us know all about it. You don't need a special occasion to open a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. But when you have a special occasion, why not celebrate with a specially engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Here's how one whiskey lover celebrated his team's recent success. He arranged to have 108 specially engraved bottles of Johnny Walker Blue Label made for his co-workers. You might say he hit a home run, just like a perfectly executed double play. Johnny Walker Blue Label is smooth and well-rounded, and unlike a trophy, never needs polishing. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. I recently had the chance to visit Diageo's distillery in Gimli, Manitoba. It's known there as the Gimli Distillery, but it could just as easily be called the Crown Royal Distillery because every drop of today's Crown Royal whiskies is distilled in Gimli. It's about an hour's drive north of Winnipeg. The distillery was originally built by Seagram's and opened up in 1968. Diageo inherited it when it acquired Crown Royal in 2001 during the breakup of Seagram's. Now, the distillery in Gimli is not open for tours on a regular basis, so when they do bring guests in to see the place, they call on several retirees to help out as tour guides. Jim Boyko was our guide. I got here in 1991 after they shut down the plant in Waterloo, Ontario. That was a Seagram plant. They were closing down plants because of volumes decreasing and so forth because of taxation or whatever. So I had an opportunity to move to Gimli and I thought it would be an adventure and uh, something I could do for maybe two years, take my family and try something different. We've been here 25 years now, 26 years now, so it actually worked out very well for me. But prior to that in Waterloo, I was in the distillery working in the production building and working in maintenance as a supervisor there for a bit uh, before that and bottling. Uh, So I got around a lot. Then, when I moved to Gimli in 91, I was asked to work as a supervisor in maturing and barreling operation. Something I didn't do, I was in Waterloo, so this is new to me, and I loved it. And I was working for Doug Kozlowski, and he was retiring, so they were training me to take over the operation here. So I did that, uh, started running the whole thing, and when when I came here, there was 32 warehouses, and I was very fortunate that I came here that we started expanding the Gimli operation because they were closing down Waterloo. So we expanded from 600,000 barrels into what we now have is 1.5, actually 1.55 million barrels here now, and will be 51 warehouses on site and not the 32. So I did that until about 2004, and then I was asked to become the director of whiskey planning and uh, blending operation in La Salle. And I did that for a number of years. And then we moved, there was a change in Diageo, and I moved to Norwalk and took over a similar capacity in more whiskey planning and warehousing and purchasing barrels for North America. and. We had a couple of uh, projects that were going on where we were starting to digitize all of our inventory. So a group of us were 
set apart to work with the Scottish team and the American team and the Canadian team, the Irish team, for a worldwide Diageo introduction to a electronic inventory. And as it turned out for everything, and our whole basics thing here. Then we uh, moved on to the Americanization of that one, and I worked out of the New York office for a long time there. So I really enjoyed it. Then I retired. <laughs> so went back for some contract work, similar to what Chris did. He worked on the distillery side. I worked in the warehouse and blending for the rum operation in St. Croix. And as soon as you could, you got back to Gimli, right? Actually, I never really left. Uh, they were kind enough that I was going to be going from plant to plant to plant. I was going to be traveling anyway. So I ended up using Gimli as a base, and I would um, travel three to four, three, three weeks out of the four a month. And I would be traveling to different operations and then to the head office. And then back here, I would spend one week in Gimli at an office here and just communicate by phone and by computer and start doing a lot of planning that I was doing. There's two operations here. We have the flavoring operation, we have a base operation. Okay, the base operation is our high volume, and we're gonna have a lower cost involved with that. But we're gonna run that cooker, that, excuse me, that corn-based whiskey, which is strictly corn on this base side. We're gonna run it through a continuous cooker. This continuous cooker, as you can imagine, is a little more cost effective than using a batch side, when the batch side being on our, on our flavoring side, which is the bourbon's rise and there. The cook's going on, we can go, a cook takes it up to about 165 to start getting those starches exposed and ready for the conversion. And that's where your enzyme from that malted barley will start taking over and moving it. Now, as it's finished its cook, it's gonna go into our, our fermenters and again, we have two kinds of fermenters. We have a square open top fermenter, which is the old traditional kind of fermenter that's been, if you've been in many distilleries, you've seen the open top ones, right from the Caribbean with the wooden ones, right through to our stainless steel ones, which are our new closed top ones. And we're gonna be using those primarily for the corn-based whiskey. After it gets through that fermentation, that fermentation will take anywhere from 55 to 60 hours for our corn-based whiskeys, up to almost 70 hours for our flavoring side. And we're going to get that alcohol content anywhere around 11 or 12 percent before the yeast has a chance to work through all of the sugars that are available. Now, once the sugars are available, as you can imagine, the yeast has no more food to go on and it dies off and you'll see the bubbling in the fermenters, it'll, it'll be non-existent. We take it over to our beer stills, and this is where we're going to head to in just a moment here. And the beer stills is the first time that it runs through. Now, with the flavoring, as I mentioned earlier, one time through the, uh, the still, and we're done. It's over to their tank here, does a quality check, and then off to the barreling operation. The corn-based whiskey, we're going to do a four-column rectification to that. So we're going to take the low wines that we get out of the beer still the first time, and we're going to run it through an aldehyde column, an alcohol column, fusel oil column, and the heads column. Each of them are going to be stripping out alcohol, and we're going to more or less take away all of that, that character that's involved in there and make it a vodka grade, so to speak. One little bit of a misnomer or just a little extra, on our batch, we're going to take that low wines that we get off the beer still, and we're going to fire up a kettle. And this kettle, which is our batch kettle, will charge that up with the low wines and we're going to gently boil it. Inside that batch kettle there's a series of uh, heating tubes that go on and then we are going to push that vapor that comes off this through the batch column here. They actually make five different types of whiskey in Gimli, two base whiskeys that are almost 100% corn, and three different types of flavoring whiskeys that are blended in various amounts with the two bases to create the different Crown Royal expressions. Now, you're going to hear Jim refer to bourbon. Let's make something very clear. In Gimli, they use the word bourbon as an internal reference for one of their flavoring whiskeys. Of course, bourbon can only be made in the U.S., and you'll never see Gimli's bourbon-style whiskey bottled on its own. The one copper still that we have on the back here this is a coffee still. 
And what we do with the coffee still is we do this one time a year for about five weeks. It's a bourbon mash bill, so it's about 65% corn, about 30% rye, and about 5% of this malted barley. We're going to take it and run it through with this beer still behind me here, this S2. And instead of taking that vapor and taking it to a product cooler, we're going to redirect that vapor over to our coffee still and further rectify it. And I'm using that word rectify. We're going to take out some of that dirtiness and we're going to again bring it to about 93, 94%. This is the product I was telling you about earlier, which has that nice banana chocolate kind of essence. This is key. So it's a two column rectification, done. Tell me about maturing whiskey here in Gimli because the climate can be pretty extreme during the winter and during the summer. It gets pretty hot here occasionally. You're right. Um, in Gimli, our ambient temperatures will swing anywhere from minus 35 degrees C to plus 33, I think it's on my home temperature gauge there. So you do have a huge swing. However, our warehouses are heated to some degree. We never go below five degrees C. We have a wet sprinkler system here, so we have to protect that. Now, maturation as itself needs seasons. So you're absolutely right. We do need a low season in our winter to cool down, but we also need a warm season to make that air migrate in and out of the barrel. Now, it does that through temperature change. So you will see our warehouses rise to around 21, 22 degrees C because there's not a lot of outside atmosphere that comes in here. You get the ambient temperatures that are going to raise up on the outside wall of the warehouse, which is going to heat it up. But you need that. You have to have that heating up of the barrel where the inside, the liquid actually expands and pushes the air in and out of the barrel. The cold winters, it's going to shrink. It's going to pull in, create a vacuum inside summer times it's going to expand and push out so you get that migration in and out and as I was explaining to a gentleman earlier today in Gimli your optimum temperatures are met so you do get a swing in this in the seasons so where we're going to get a whiskey that's going to be fantastic it should be anywhere from about 7 to 11 years if you get down in Kentucky where your temperatures are going to go from 25 degrees F to 125 you will get huge swings huge pressure gains, pressure uh, decreases. And you're going to then get a faster maturation. So your bourbons may mature from five to eight years, maybe optimums. In Scotland, where you're gonna get a very much more subtle kind of change because they don't get the huge swings that we get in Gimli or in Kentucky, you're gonna get it more subtle and your whiskeys are gonna be probably best in around the 10 to 15 years. So if you take care of the whiskey by never letting it get uh, much below about 5 degrees C, they're taking better care of the whiskeys than they are you guys because I, I know it doesn't stop at 5 degrees C down here. You're absolutely right. It's, it, it gets cold here. As I mentioned, minus 35 on my temperature machine. And so, it, What's it like moving barrels around in minus 35? You know, um, we have guys that go out in their trucks and they're on a forklift. You're picking 12 barrels up at a time. But they're inside a heated warehouse. You are moving them outside into a truck. And it can be in the minus 30 with the wind whipping and the snow falling. So it is a little bit of a tense drive on the icy road from the warehouse back to the barreling operation. And then picking up a load of freshly filled barrels, taking them back out to another warehouse. But we do have good sanding precautions that are going on, so there's no slipping and sliding. And our guys are really, they're, they're right on the ball. Tell me about the old Waterloo distillery, because that has sort of disappeared into memory after the place burned down a few years ago. But that was really where Crown Royal got its start, wasn't it? Absolutely. You know, I haven't had that question come to me for a long time. I started out in 1972 in Waterloo, and I, just out of school, I didn't have the history behind me, but that was uh, the Seagram family developed that in the 1857, and it was a grist mill. Um, this was a place where you could make alcohol and sell it. Crown Royal came on board in 1939, I believe, King George VI, I believe it was, a presentation for him. 
It is an old factory, an old place with small rooms built one after the other. It wasn't very efficient. It was right in the middle of town. Um, so it had six warehouses, no, seven warehouses on site when I came there. And it stored about 180,000 barrels. Uh, we also had a remote warehousing operation in Breslau, Ontario, where we had another 500,000 barrels. And everything on that site was rack and tier. Now, as opposed to what you saw today, you saw palletized warehouses. Rack and tier was the introduction to storage of whiskey on barrels. Lay it down on its belly and roll it into the rack. And uh, that's still being done in Kentucky in a variety of places. However, more of the newer uh, warehouses will, are going to pallet. But in getting back to Waterloo, I had a real introduction. I learned so much at that plant. Uh, I was involved in the distillation in the dry house and the cooking operation. I really got to know my way around the distillery and I never really got too much into the warehousing aspect there but uh, I did work in the maintenance area for a while so I got to know that they were around but I was more familiar with the uh, distillation. Tell me about the day they closed Waterloo. 1990 in October a uh, very, very traumatic day for 210 people who didn't know what was the next day is going to hold. And uh, we were all believing that our job would be forever kind of thing. And then we were told that, you know, we weren't efficient. And there wasn't the sales to really keep that plant going. And we were located right in the middle of Waterloo. So there was the noise pollution that was going on. There was smells that were em emitting from the plant that may not have been to everyone's approval. Um, it, was, it, was ex it wasn't as efficient as what I thought it was. And I only really learned that when I moved to Gimli to find out what a real efficient modern plant works like. So I, um, I was disappointed. I had lost my job and I uh, had a young family. And at the time, in the early 90s, late 80s, Ontario government uh, wasn't really conducive to a lot of growth. So the job didn't look all that uh, appetizing. So job market wasn't always there. So I was offered a position in Gimli, Manitoba. And as I said, I was fortunate. There's 210 people that I know that were working there and seven got jobs. So in the industry, in Seagram's. They all eventually got jobs or retired or whatever, uh, moved on. But um, in Seagram, seven of us went on to other jobs. I was uh, fortunate. I was one of the seven. So that was pretty, pretty uh, good day when I was got the offer to come to Gimli, and uh, not knowing at all what I was setting my feet into. But I was a pretty happy guy right now. What did you think when you hit the prairie for the first time and saw this? I saw it on March 1st, uh, 1991. I arrived by, by airplane and got off in the dark, snowy west. It was only about minus 30, and they told me to get a rental car and drive to Gimli. And uh, pretty dark, pretty cold and blowy. I thought, what the hell am I doing? And uh, actually, the people here were so friendly. So helpful to me, uh, can't begin to tell you how comforting it was. It was easy for me uh, to come to Gimli. My, uh, I, I was busy, I came to work, I did my job, went home, and my family, however, may have been a little bit traumatized. My wife, I know, was. Um, my wife was maybe a little bit uh, lonely at times. We had no relatives out in this way, but uh, since we've adapted quite well. And now it's home. It is home for us. Um, my two children who I brought here when they were nine and five are still in the Winnipeg area. They went to university here. They both followed my wife's footsteps in the medical field. So my son is a nurse, uh, a BN at the hospital in Winnipeg, and my daughter is a psychiatrist now in Winnipeg. So 
they're not moving. They are married, have children, and my wife told me we're not moving away from our grandchildren. So we're staying. And they didn't follow you into the whiskey industry? No, they didn't. Uh, you know, I don't blame them. Uh, they have great positions where they are. They love what they're doing, and good for them. Thanks to Jim Boyko for the tour and for sharing his own stories with us on this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth. Full disclosure, I was in Gimli as part of a media tour organized by Diageo, but as with all of our content, full editorial control over this segment remains with WhiskeyCast. That's this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, where patience has been awarded. Lagavulin 25 is Whiskey Advocates' Isla Single Malt of the Year. This 25-year-old whiskey, matured exclusively in sherry casks, is a recognition of the distillers that have crafted Lagavulin across the years. Learn more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. And since I'm heading to Houston, Texas, for Tuesday night's tasting at Reserve 101, I decided to warm up with some Texas whiskeys. A few weeks ago, I mentioned Ranger Creek's experiment, taking the same white dog spirit and putting it into both standard size 53-gallon barrels and smaller barrels, around 20 gallons or so. The whiskey from those big barrels is bottled as Ranger Creek's 36 Texas Straight Bourbon after two to four years of maturation, while the whiskey from the smaller barrels is bottled as 36 Small Caliber Bourbon. I received samples of both recently and had the chance to taste them side by side to see just how much difference barrel size makes. Let's start off with the Small Caliber Bourbon. It's bottled at 48% ABV after 11 months of maturation. The nose has notes of oak tannins, vanilla, allspice, cedar shavings, and brown sugar. While the taste is spicy with black peppercorns, chili powder, oak tannins, vanilla, and brown sugar. The finish is long, spicy, and it fades away gently. I'll give you my score for it in just a minute. Now, the Ranger Creek 36 Texas Straight Bourbon is also bottled at 48% ABV, This one, the nose is sweet with caramel, brown sugar, and molasses notes, along with muted spices, vanilla, and just a touch of oak. The taste is thick and spicy with notes of black peppercorns, a hint of chili powder, oak, vanilla, caramel, and brown sugar. The finish is long with lingering spices and touches of caramel and fudge in the background. I'd give the straight bourbon from those standard size barrels higher marks for complexity and balance than the small caliber bourbon, but I have to admit it's difficult to tell them apart without a lot of examination, and of course part of the difference could be attributed to the longer maturation time for the straight bourbon. I'm scoring the Ranger Creek 36 Texas straight bourbon an 88, and the 36 small caliber bourbon an 87. More tasting notes in a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. It's family-owned and operated since 1935, and Heaven Hill remains fiercely independent and committed to the traditions and history of American whiskey, with an award-winning range including Evan Williams and Elijah Craig Bourbons and Rittenhouse and Pikesville Rise. Meet the whole family at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Let's take a look now at the Firestone and Robertson Texas Straight Bourbon. This one is distilled in Fort Worth at Firestone and Robertson's original distillery and is bottled at 45% ABV. The nose is warm and spicy with notes of allspice, white pepper, a hint of ginger, brown sugar, caramel, peach pie, and just a slight nuttiness. The taste has good fruity touches of peach pie and plums at first, followed by spicy white pepper and allspice notes, along with touches of caramel, brown sugar, and molasses underneath. The finish is long with smoothly fading spices and an underlying fruitiness. I'm scoring the Firestone and Robertson Texas Straight Bourbon an 89. Let's finish up with a Texas Single Malt, the recently released Balconis Texas Single Malt Single Barrel. This one was matured for three years and two months in a French oak barrel and bottled at 64% ABV with just 180 bottles available through the distillery. 
The nose on my sample has notes of roasted almonds, charred oak, touches of plums and figs, shoe leather, and a hint of cedar shavings. The taste is spicy and intense with touches of clove, allspice, black tea with honey, and a touch of molasses cookies that comes out as the spices begin to fade. The finish is long and dry with those fading spices, molasses cookies, and touches of black tea and leather. I'm scoring the Balcones Texas Malt Single Barrel, cask number 4749 to be exact, a 91. This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, and I'll be adding them to our searchable list of more than 1,900 different whiskeys from around the world at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you can find links for WhiskeyCast HD and WhiskeyCast virtual tastings episodes, the latest whiskey news, events, and much more, including a complete archive of past episodes. You can help other whiskey lovers discover WhiskeyCast by leaving reviews at iTunes or your favorite podcast directory. And keep in touch with us all week long on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. My email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2017, and comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.